Super Mario 64 is a game that seems to be immune to the passage of time. Its popularity has never truly waned, and even a quarter century later it boasts one of the most passionate fan bases that any game has ever seen. Whether it's the incredible modders releasing new versions of the game, breathtaking speedrunners pushing the limits of how fast it can be beaten, or simply nostalgic fans replaying the game on the Switch, Super Mario 64 is alive and well in the 2020s. While there is no denying how revolutionary the gameplay in this best-selling N64 title was, running, jumping, and wall-kicking wouldn't be fun if the levels Mario had to explore were boring. Thankfully, Super Mario 64 features some of the most iconic and memorable levels in video game history that remain as benchmarks for the franchise to this day. However, the question must be asked, which level in Super Mario 64 is the best? Well, by exploring every world to see what makes each of them special, I hope to answer that question today. Welcome to every Super Mario 64 level ranked. Of all the courses in Super Mario 64, one stage stands out amongst all the others as the clear worst in the game. Dire Dire Docks is perhaps the single blemish on Super Mario 64's otherwise perfectly defined, toned, muscular body, and it's a shame because it's one of only two courses in the game, along with Bob on Battlefield, that you're forced to visit at least once. It's lucky that it shares its name with one of the most iconic songs to come from the Mario franchise, as it's genuinely the only thing keeping its legacy in a positive light. It's hard to think of a more universally panned 3D Mario level than Dire Dire Docks, and it's not hard to see why. Boarding Bowser's sub isn't too bad if it's the only star you're collecting from the level, but even then it feels like it breaks up the flow of the game with its restrictive and slow-moving underwater controls. However, if you're going for all 120 stars so you can see your good pal Yoshi, then Dire Dire Docks becomes a massive slog with some of the most frustrating missions in the game. Chest in the Current is just a more punishing rehash of the same mission we saw twice in Jolly Roger Bay. Pole Jumping for Red Coins has a janky camera that can cause you to miss your jump and repeatedly fall in the water. And the course hosts one of the two tightest 100 coin stars in the game, which leaves you little room for error. Dire Dire Docks just lacks a strong identity that every stage before and after it was able to develop. Perhaps had Jolly Roger Bay and Wet Dry World not made it into the game, Dire Dire Docks could have stood out as the singular water level in Super Mario 64 instead of feeling so bland and generic by comparison. As it stands, I truly believe it would be a forgotten course if it didn't have such a legendary music track attached to its name because it does little else to impress. Thankfully, like all Super Mario 64 levels, it still won't take very long to collect every star Dire Dire Docks has to offer despite its slower pace, preventing the game's worst course from having a major impact on the overall experience. Tall Tall Mountain may not be the worst stage in Super Mario 64, but it certainly has the laziest design. While it isn't uncommon to see other courses in the game have you repeat the same task more than once, Tall Tall Mountain is the worst offender of this by far. No stage in the game has more repetitive stars, with five of the seven missions requiring you to scale at least three quarters of the mountain. One time is just to collect a star at the top, another is to speak to a monkey, then again to grab a star hidden behind a waterfall, and twice more to enter the level secret slide, once to collect coins for the 100 coin star, and another time to collect a star just for sliding. As the 12th stage in the game, there is an expectation to continue to innovate and introduce new ideas, which this level does neither of. The mountain itself just feels like a slightly larger version of what we see in bob -omb Battlefield. The secret slide concept already had four stars centered around it earlier in the game, and we've seen countless red coin and bob -omb cannon stars by this point as well. Even though I love the monkeys that steal your hat in this level, Tall Tall Mountain is simply too stale and unoriginal to be ranked any higher. Its lack of an interesting gimmick really hurts it when there are stages like Wet Dry World and Tiny Huge Island on the same floor, and it's the main reason, despite none of the stars being particularly bad, that I have to place it among the bottom three courses in Super Mario 64. Jolly Roger Bay is iconic for three main reasons. The first is that it's on the first floor of Peach's Castle as one of the first few stages that you can enter. 
The second is that it's likely the first time the Dire Dire Docks music track is heard in-game. And the final reason is because of the eel monster hidden inside the pirate ship. Without those three ingredients coming together, Jolly Roger Bay would be a bottom of the barrel level, which just goes to show how important pacing and level placement is. I say that because most of Jolly Roger Bay's charm comes from the novelty of having just started the game. Honestly, all four of the initial first floor courses benefit greatly from being the stages that get to shape your initial experiences in Super Mario 64, but unfortunately Jolly Roger Bay is the only one that doesn't hold up when the nostalgia wears off. Although the massive eel is part of what makes this world memorable, I've always had inconsistencies when trying to lure him out, and nothing frustrates me more than having to swim away to grab air, only to come back and do the same thing I did before and have it work for some reason. My own personal experiences aside, the quality of the stars are not on the same level as other courses in the game. Through the Jet Stream is a broken mission that you can complete by simply swimming straight into the star from above. Red Coins on the ship afloat is slow and tedious and requires you to explore underwater, yet restricts the amount of time you can spend searching by forcing you to repeatedly surface for air. And both missions that have you opening chests are frustrating trial and error puzzles that should have been presented in the reverse order. Not to mention it has the tightest 100 coin star in the game, with a measly 4 extra coins above the mark that you need. Atmosphere and nostalgia are really what carry Jolly Roger Bay as opposed to solid level design and gameplay, and for that I can't rank it any higher. Snowman's Land is a largely unremarkable level that doesn't really do anything wrong, but does very little to stand out at the same time. Being tucked away inside a room with no formal painting towards the end of the game doesn't help its memorability, and I often find myself glossing over this level when talking about Super Mario 64. Its giant snowman theme doesn't feel very creative either, and as a result, Cool Cool Mountain is the default snow level that comes to mind when thinking about the game's various courses. Still, Snowman's Land has nothing glaringly wrong with it aside from being kind of dull. Stars like In the Deep Freeze were nice when I was younger as it was something easy and obtainable, but nowadays it feels like filler and a waste of time. Chill with the Bully similarly feels unnecessary as we just completed several similar missions in Lethal Lava Land just a few courses earlier. Even the concept of the stage gets overshadowed because when I think of Snowman in Super Mario 64, I think first of the one we help in Cool Cool Mountain and not of the giant centerpiece this course is named after. The only truly memorable aspect of Snowman's Land is the Into the Igloo mission because it felt rewarding to discover, but by itself is not able to push this stage any higher up the list. While Rainbow Ride can be a bit boring at times with the amount of time that you spend riding magic carpets, I feel it is a fitting final stage for Super Mario 64. The challenge is appropriately ramped up here as the course punishes you much harder for mistakes than any of the other stages on the previous three levels of Peach's Castle. As a result, it feels good to get every star in Rainbow Ride, not just because of the sense of accomplishment that comes from completing a difficult challenge, but also for the sense of satisfaction that comes from seeing your journey come to an end. Rainbow Ride's atmosphere is unique for this reason, despite a fairly weak theme. Now you could argue that any stage placed in the last spot would gain this atmosphere, and while there is some merit to that, I also think that Rainbow Ride has some genuinely fun stars. Swinging in the Breeze features a really enjoyable platforming challenge that I wish we saw more of throughout the game. Tricky Triangle similarly is a fun little time challenge that, while not too hard, still feels good to complete. And although it can take a little long to get to, the Rainbow Cruiser is a memorable set piece that I enjoy launching from to get the stage's final star. It's definitely not a perfect level by any means, but I do enjoy Rainbow Ride and feel it deserves a little more praise than it usually gets. <laughs> Over the years, my opinion of Hazy Maze Cave has only gotten more positive as I've learned to appreciate its intricate level design. As the name of the stage might indicate, Hazy Maze Cave is not the easiest to navigate, and I can remember getting lost or confused many times when playing this game as a young kid. However, in spite of my initial frustrations with the level, Hazy Maze Cave has become one of my favorite stages to go back to and play thanks to how dynamic it is. Its interconnectedness allows you to play the course in a number of different ways, and many of the stars have more than one route that can lead you to them. 
Truth be told, what tanks this world for me is the 100 coin mission, which is one of my least favorite in the game. It's tedious, with no big coin pickups outside the blue coins, which themselves can be hard to collect in the toxic maze. There are many bottomless pits that can reset all your progress, making it nerve-wracking to platform at high coin counts. And worst of all is the ability to accidentally exit the stage by entering the green switch secret area, undoing all of your progress. Outside of the 100 coin star, I enjoy stars like Metalhead Mario Can Move and Swimming Beast in the Cavern for using Dory, which help the stage to stand out. Unfortunately, despite other good stars and a stellar atmosphere, I can't quite get past Hazy Maze Cave's 100 coin star, which is why it just cracks the top 10. Why is it exciting to see comically big Goombas, teeny tiny little Koopas, and massive fire-breathing piranha plants? I can't explain why it's so fascinating to see things scale dramatically up or down from their normal size, but it absolutely helps make Tiny Huge Island one of the most recognizable courses in the Mario franchise. Although the concept for the stage is ripped straight from World 4-6 of Super Mario Bros. 3, it doesn't stop Tiny Huge Island from being any less exciting to explore. It's one of the best stages to goof around in, and a rare example of a course whose appeal comes primarily from its gimmick, rather than the level design and missions. That being said, Tiny Huge Island has a few particularly memorable missions, including one where Mario invades Wiggler's home to beat him up for a star. You also have a rematch with Koopa the Quick, which while not too different from your showdown on bob -Omb Battlefield, is fun because you learn that your competitor calls Tiny Huge Island home. This stage also has some neat features like the ability to switch back and forth between tiny and huge versions in level, as well as things like the Cheap Chomp that will eat Mario if he stays in the water too long. Overall, Tiny Huge Island is a solid world that executes its gimmick well, and does a good job of keeping Super Mario 64 interesting deep into the game. To be honest, I'm not really sure what it is about Shifting Sandland that prevents me from ranking it any higher. It has interesting and unique missions, it has solid level design and theming, its gimmick is memorable as are its missions, yet despite all this, something about Shifting Sandland has always rubbed me the wrong way. It's a level that I want to like more than I do, but has always felt like a middle of the pack course instead. If I had to place my finger on one thing, I'd say that it is perhaps due to the stage's slower nature. Many of the missions in this level are not as straightforward as they are in other Super Mario 64 courses, which means you'll be spending a little more time in Shifting Sandland than your typical stage. Outside of speedrunning strats, there is no quick way to complete stars like Stand Tall on the Four Pillars or Pyramid Puzzle, even if they are cool missions. Now, I don't think complexity is a bad thing, and these stars are certainly still very good, but I think I also value being able to quickly get in and out of a course because there are so many to get to in the game. In the end, what I think is really going on is that Shifting Sandland is a good, respectable level that just can't measure up to some of the other game's phenomenal courses. That's not a knock at Shifting Sandland either, just a testament to how good Super Mario 64's other levels are, and ultimately the reason it lands at 8th place on this list. One of the coolest features in Super Mario 64 is how a stage can be different depending on how you enter it. While that may be obvious for a stage like Tiny Huge Island, which has two separate paintings, less obvious is how we can change the starting water level in Wet Dry World depending on what height we jump into the painting at. It's one of my favorite secrets in Super Mario 64, not just because it makes navigating the level easier, but because it's a feature that is so satisfying to discover as well. It's the type of realization that makes you wonder what other little things you've missed along your journey, and the level of excitement that comes from wanting to explore to find out is hard to replicate. Additionally, discovering the underwater town in Wet Dry World has to be among the coolest set pieces in the game. It feels very important as the town is revealed to you after a long swim, and it makes Wet Dry World a large, more important feeling stage. The novelty of this town and the water level feature are two of the biggest reasons Wet Dry World tops the courses on the third floor of Peach's Castle for me, but credit should also be given to the increase in platforming difficulty found here thanks to missions like Shocking Arrow Lifts and Express Elevator Hurry Up. It's no wonder why this level is among Super Mario 64's most polarizing stages, because it's also one of the hardest. 
People tend to either love or hate Wet Dry World, and regardless of how annoying it may be to get chucked off the level by that damn purple bob bomb, I will always maintain my belief that this course gets more hate than it deserves. I'm sure there are those out there who think it's absurd to put TikTok clock this high, and I understand where they are coming from. Considering how I complained about how Tall Tall Mountain was lazy and forced you to do the same thing over and over, TikTok clock similarly can feel quite repetitive when going for every star it has to offer. Additionally, TikTok clock is much more punishing than Tall Tall Mountain, and very well may be the most difficult stage in the game. However, I think what sets TikTok Clock apart from Tall Tall Mountain and nearly every other stage in the game is its incredible level design. While true that most of the course's stars just require Mario to ascend further and further up the clock, as you become more familiar with the stage layout, more and more platforming possibilities open up to you. There are so many creative ways to get to the top that it never stops being fun to push your limits and test your skills. It is a stage that really rewards you for having mastery of the game's controls, and in some spots demands it, which is appropriate for the game's penultimate level. There's no denying that its vertical nature can lead to huge amounts of frustration, but I think it's also what makes it the most satisfying challenge to conquer in Super Mario 64. By the time you collect the last star in TikTok Clock, there will be a deeper level of satisfaction knowing that you did something that's difficult to do, and you will feel like you earned it. However, I think what really endears me to this stage is its time manipulation gimmick. Much like we touched on with Wet Dry World earlier, TikTok Clock is a level that will start very differently depending on how you enter its painting. By entering at specific times, Mario can slow down time, speed time up, or freeze time entirely. Doing this can make certain stars significantly harder or easier, which is nice to know if you're struggling with a particular mission. As a kid, this information was infinitely valuable and a true game changer, which is why it stands out as the best gimmick in Super Mario 64. And for that reason, as well as its terrific level design, TikTok Clock ranks just outside the top five. bob -omb Battlefield succeeds because it introduces you to so much of what Super Mario 64 has to offer in such a short period of time. Mechanics like ground pounding, flying, and shooting out of cannons are all explored here through the various stars. You meet many characters such as Koopa the Quick, the Pink bob -ombs, and of course King bob -omb himself that help the stage to stand out. There are secrets to discover like the fact that you can teleport between flower beds or gain coins by spinning around wooden logs. And to top it all off, you've got plenty of classic Mario enemies like Goombas, bob -ombs, and even a huge Chain Chomp that helped give the stage a familiar feel. I don't know if 1-1 from Super Mario Bros. can ever really be supplanted as the most famous video game level of all time, but if it could, I'd venture a guess that bob -omb Battlefield would be one of the few to be in the discussion to do so. As Super Mario 64's legacy grows, and more and more people are exposed to it each year, this level will rightfully only become more iconic over time. bob -omb Battlefield is the definition of a classic level because it does so many things so well. From its instantly recognizable tune, to its unmistakable landmarks, this course is able to captivate you from the very moment you enter the stage. And because of its timelessness, as well as the nostalgia it induces, bob -omb Battlefield ranks as one of Super Mario 64's five best levels. Call me simple, but some of my favorite stars in Super Mario 64 are tied to the various slides found throughout the game. From Princess Peach's Secret Slide to Tall Tall Mountain's Mountainside Slide, it never stops being fun to zip along at high speeds as you try to grab as many coins as you can without falling to your doom. Cool Cool Mountain is, in essence, a gigantic slide itself, and as such is one of my favorite levels in the game. Slip Slide in the Way, The Big Penguin Race, Frosty Slide for 8 red coins, and Snowman's Lost His Head are all missions that involve this gameplay mechanic, but truthfully it's the course's other stars that bring this level into Super Mario 64's upper echelon. Tell me, is there a more universal gaming memory than that of throwing the baby penguin you're supposed to rescue off the side of the stage? What is it about this cute penguin that compelled so many of us to prematurely end its life? I'm not really sure, but this mission, and the ability to commit murder in it, has always made Cool Cool Mountain stand out to me. 
then throw in awesome platforming challenges like wall kicks will work, which is another terrific example of how you can get stars in unintended ways, and you have the recipe for one of the best levels not just in Super Mario 64, but in the entire Mario franchise. Cool Cool Mountain is a course that I always enjoy going back to, not just for its fun gameplay, but for its wintry atmosphere and catchy soundtrack as well, and it's why it deserves the number 4 spot on this list. As someone who is really not into horror-themed stuff, I'm somewhat surprised at how fond of Big Boo's Haunt I am. With so many legendary stages in Super Mario 64, I wasn't expecting to rank it this high on the list, but as I reflected more and more on this course, I realized just how excellent it really is. What makes this such a special stage is how it shifts the tone in such a dramatic way, especially in comparison to the other levels on the first floor. As a kid, Big Boo's Haunt genuinely felt evil next to the relaxing vibes of Jolly Rogers Bay and the wholesome nature of Cool Cool Mountain, and even today it feels jarring to play through after coming from those upbeat stages. From the boos that will emerge out of the walls, to the demon books that will fly off bookshelves, all the way to the infamous piano that'll try and bite you if you get too close, there is no shortage of jump scares in this stage. Playing through this level for the first time is both tricky and off-putting, which contributes to the feeling of uneasiness that you should have when traversing a haunted house. I'll never forget the first time that I got dropped down into the merry-go-round area in the basement because I was so creeped out by the juxtaposition of that happy music in this otherwise spooky place. But theme aside, which it executes as well as any other in the game, Big Boo's Haunt has some of my favorite stars in Super Mario 64. Go on a Ghost Hunt, the first star, is so unique compared to everything you will have likely experienced up until that point in the game, and I love that it culminates in a showdown with Big Boo after you've eliminated all the smaller boos throughout the house. I like how it's a mission focused on combat instead of platforming, which is something I enjoy about Ride Big Boo's merry-go-round as well. Secret of the Haunted Books is another star that has always stood out to me because it was one of the first stars that I ever figured out an alternate way of getting. It's a fine enough mission as is, but the ability to grab it by making a leap across balconies has been cemented in my head as one of the reasons I love Super Mario 64. It's a perfect example of the freedom that this N64 classic gives you, and the ability to get things out of order or in unintended ways is one of my favorite aspects in any video game. With so much going for it, if you ranked Big Boo's Haunt as the best course in the game, it'd be hard to argue with you because even though I'm placing it third, to me it's as good as any other stage in Super Mario 64. I think it says a lot about the quality of Womp's Fortress's level design that it got brought back as the throwback galaxy in Super Mario Galaxy 2. The fact that it is enjoyable to play in two completely different engines just goes to show the genius behind how everything is laid out to be the perfect playground for Mario to platform in. Everything feels purposeful and in a specific place to allow for some truly incredible movement, and I still remember the first time I saw someone do a triple jump into a jump kick as a method to obtain the Caged Island Star. It completely blew my mind that that was possible, but also opened my eyes to just how great not only Womp's Fortress was, but Super Mario 64 as a whole. However, even if you aren't pushing the mechanics of the game to their limits, the stars in this level are still incredibly fun to get. In fact, the traditional method of getting the Caged Island Star is actually one of the reasons Womp's Fortress has always stood out to me, because catching a ride with the owl and whooshing up to the sky is one of the coolest moments in the entire game. Likewise, destroying the wall that hosts a hidden star by firing Mario out of a cannon into it is an awesome moment that is extremely satisfying and a pretty unique concept for a mission as well. And of course, it's great to lay the smack down on the Womp King and watch him explode into bits in the course's first power star. Truth be told, there's not a bad star in Womp's Fortress, and despite being the second course, it set the bar extremely high for Super Mario 64's other levels, and in my opinion, there is only one stage that barely nudges it out of the top spot. The essence of what makes Super Mario 64 a classic is to me found no more strongly than in Lethal Lava Land. While it may not be the game's most recognizable stage, the sense of freedom that Lethal Lava Land provides players is what makes it Super Mario 64's greatest level. While the stage's missions are fairly simple, and it lacks a memorable music track, 
Lethal Lava Land compensates by giving the player as many options to complete its missions as it can. This versatility makes Super Mario 64's seventh course stand out amongst the lineup of other legendary courses and what earns it the top spot on this list. As someone who has played this game many times over the course of my life, the different strategies that I've employed over the years serve as somewhat of a snapshot of my evolution as a gamer. When things were a little too tough for seven-year-old Mr. Dr. Boy, it was time to grab the wing cap and simply bypass all hazards to collect the stars. When 13-year-old Mr. Dr. Boy was feeling a weird duty to play the game as intended, it was time for a pure platforming run. When 19-year-old Mr. Dr. Boy got exposed to speedrunning, it was all about turning hazards into tools by using the lava for micro-sequence breaks. And now, present-day Mr. Dr. Boy loves hopping on the Koopa shell to swag out and surf the lava because it's relaxing and fun. The fact that I have so many options for getting around the stage makes this such an exciting course to come back to because no playthrough will feel exactly the same. This is something I value deeply, and I can't stress how important a quality this is for a game like Super Mario 64. Then add in an awesome feature like a second area that can only be accessed by entering the volcano, and you have a truly unforgettable level. While there is certainly justification for any of the top 5 levels on this list to be number 1, Lethal Lava Land is the place where I have the most fun and feel most free, and it's why I've decided to name it Super Mario 64's number 1 course. I hope you all enjoyed my ranking of every course in Super Mario 64. There were so many terrific levels to choose from that at a point I was splitting hairs to decide placements, so be sure to let me know how you'd rank the levels in the comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed this video and want to support me, be sure to subscribe and like the video, as well as drop a suggestion for a future ranked video that you'd like to see. Thanks for watching.